This is Jay Martin. All right, I have 20 minutes with Grant Williams and about 10 years of information I want to pull out of him, so we're going to do our best here. <laughs> Um, but uh, thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thanks for everybody for, for joining us. It's, it's been fun. So here's what I want to talk about today. I read your newsletter. It comes out every third Sunday of the month. And you've been speaking a lot about the concept of de-dollarization and the various ways this is already occurring, mainly in Eastern economies. The reason I want to dive deeper on this subject with you today is because you have a habit, Grant, of being early on stories. And for example, like a recent example would be when <clears throat> the United States confiscated the 600 billion US dollar reserves from Russia. A lot of people wrote that off as another sanction. It's just another sanction. You were one of a few who was saying, no, you're missing the bigger picture here this is potentially as significant as Nixon taking the dollar off the gold standard. Yeah. Uh, fast forward nine months, and we're seeing actions that would reflect that, right? We're seeing uh, oil for gold deals occur, right? Non-dollar gold transactions. We're seeing the, emer the emergence of a petro yuan. Um, so I want you to, could you expand on this concept of de-dollarization as you see it today, why it's catching your attention, and what you think people are missing, what the bigger picture is? Yeah, I think I think this is um, this is a really really important story that everyone in this room needs to needs to pay attention to. And uh, that that move you talked about when the Treasury sanctioned the Russian central bank assets, um, guys I've spoken to at the Federal Reserve have told me that the first thing they knew about it was when we knew about it. This was a Treasury move, uh, you know, in the heat of a response to an aggressive act by a foreign nation, and the Fed weren't consulted about this. This was the Treasury. Um, and I said at the time, this was a crazy, crazy overreach. And what they effectively did when they confiscated the Russian central bank assets was they said to every other central bank in the world, you now need to think about what you're going to do if we do this to you. Because ultimately, the Russians are on the wrong side of American policy. Um, and this is what happened. And you know, the one thing that separated the West from many places in the East over the last you know, half a century is the rule of law and the rule of contract and this belief that your assets are safe in America, they're safe in Australia, in the UK. Um, and the Treasury just rode roughshod over that. So at the time, I think I wrote a piece called The End of the Financial World as We Know It. And that's, that's what I believe this to be. It, ch it changes everything. And it forces people to change the way they think about how they safeguard their reserves. So when we, when we look at what they've done, and we look at this idea of de-dollarization, uh, you can go back 10 years, and the only thing that's happened recently is stories that were on page 75 of the newspaper and in the, you know, the, the weekend style section have started to make their way to the front page. So there has been an ongoing effort for over a decade now by Russia and China and the Saudis and the Iranians to come up with a way to put together a payment system that means they don't have to go through SWIFT. Because at the moment, if you deal in dollars, you have to go through the SWIFT system. Uh, and because of that, it, it weaponizes the US dollar. The, the, the Americans can cut any country in the world out of the SWIFT system, which we saw they threatened to do to Russia right at the beginning of this. They backed off, and then they, then they seized the assets. Um, so this has been something that has been an imperative for, for these countries for over a decade now. And the Chinese were talking about it in 2012. Um, I did a presentation, in fact, in 2015, I think it was, called um, Get It, Got It Good, which you can find on YouTube somewhere, talking about why this was so important. Um, but now the dots have been joined for an awful lot of people because we've seen, uh, we saw a very high profile visit by Xi Jinping to Riyadh a couple of months ago. It was the first ever visit by a, a Chinese head of state to Saudi. We've seen deals being done um, between oil producing nations and oil consuming nations that may be small at the moment, but they are denominated in uh, currencies other than dollar. So the Saudis can sell oil to um, China and get payment in yuan. And this has been something that people have said wasn't going to be an issue because the yuan is a closed capital account. You can't get the currency out of the country. It doesn't make any difference. But another piece of the puzzle about four or five years ago, six years ago, 
Um, there's a way that you can transact uh, offshore yuan and exchange it for gold. So there is a way you can go into yuan, go to the Shanghai Gold Exchange and take out gold. So there is now a way which you can sell your oil for yuan and convert that oil into gold. So you're not stuck in the Chinese currency. So all these little building blocks have been put in place over the last 10 years and everybody has looked at them and said, these don't matter, they're tiny little agreements, There's the, the amount of money flowing in either direction is too small to worry about. Fast forward to 2022 and what the Treasury did to the Russian central bank assets and now these stories are starting to get more traction. What's happened is very quietly an entire payment system has been built which enables and facilitates this trade and though it's been tested in small amounts, it works. And ultimately, once these gateways are in place and once these rails are in place, these payment rails, they can start ramping up this trade directly between nations and cut the dollar out. Now, that, the immediate problem that solves is it, say, it takes away the weaponization of the dollar. It, it, it makes it much harder for the United States to say, we will completely stop you transacting in dollars. Therefore, if you are trying to act, uh, transact in your most, natural, uh, most, most important natural resource, oil, energy, we can stop you doing that because you can't use the SWIFT payment system. That's now gone. Uh, countries can do that, and they are doing it increasingly. Um, the bigger problem for the United States is it, it lessens the necessity of foreigners to hold dollar reserves. You know, if, if, if you've been forced to pay for your oil, your energy imports in US dollars, you have to keep a significant portion of your reserves in dollars. And that's allowed the US to run up these enormous deficits we've seen uh, emerging over the years. So the less demand there is for dollars, the trickier it's going to be to finance the US debt. And I think Brent touched upon this, and, and Russell talked about this on our panel this morning. You know, this is a process, not an event. I think it's a great way of putting it. Because this is not a switch that gets flicked overnight. This is something that is an alternative to a system that's been put in place. And it gives great flexibility to countries who may or may not be, excuse my French, on the US shit list from time to time. And that's the most important thing. It's about having a plan B. And I think for everybody in this room, for everybody who's investing, uh, whether it's 401ks, whether it's retirement money, whether it's just speculation that you want to make, the idea of having a plan B right now in 2023 has never been more important in the last 50 years. Because the changes that are being made at these kind of supranational levels between governments, between central banks, will ripple down into the way that we have to think about how we protect our assets. And for me, you know, I've, I still own the first ounce of gold I've ever bought. It's something that I don't trade. I, I accumulate over time. Um, there are times when I get vociferous about, I think the next little period is going to be good for gold. And there are times when I just stay away and I just hold on to my position. I think what de-dollarization means is not necessarily a bid for rubles or a bid for yuan, a bid for other currencies, a bid for the euro. What it means is getting your reserves out of dollars. And for many countries, that's going to mean commodities. That's going to mean stockpiling copper. It's going to mean an increase in the allocation of gold to central banks, which we've seen 55 tons of gold, the, the biggest in 60 years, purchased in the fourth quarter of last year. So when you think about de-dollarization, try not to think of it as well, what's the alternative? People aren't going to use the euro. They're not going to use the ruble. They're not going to use... It's how do we hold our reserves in something that isn't the dollar? And that, I suspect, a big part of that is going to be commodities, which is a, going to be a huge tailwind. That's a very long answer to a short question. For That's Sean what Poses. I wanted. No, that was excellent. Thank you very much for that. Now, so the system is new. Well, the point is there is now a system, a mechanism to exchange commodities for something other than U.S. dollars. The transactions are small because the system is new, but now the system's in place, the transactions can scale. Am I following this correctly? Now, Correct. W it, was this just a short-sighted decision on behalf of the Treasury, or is there some upside to the US or the United States economy to have a multipolar currency world? Is there any upside here? Could this look, have been well thought through and forecasted to work out like this? Well, I think, look, I think we have to take away the action of the Treasury against the Russians, because that was a response to an act of aggression, right? So I, I, I don't think they thought that through. I think most people thought he was never going to cross that border. When he did, it demanded 
some kind of statement uh, that wasn't going to be military in the first case. They talked about, in the first couple of days, if you remember, they talked about cutting them off out of SWIFT and decided against that. They came out and said, we're not going to do that because they realized that that would cause problems and ripples through the rest of the economy. What they did instead, I think, made matters worse. So in terms of tailwinds for the US, it's tough right now, given the financial condition of the United States, to see how this helps them because this need for dollars around the world, and, and um, I think Brent Johnson's talking tomorrow, uh, no one does a better job of explaining this than Brent, and everyone in this room should go and listen to Brent when he talks tomorrow. Um, but lessening the need for other countries to own dollars is a big problem right now, because you know we have $220 trillion of entitlements that need paying, yeah. uh, we have massive borrowings in the US dollars, and those those bonds have to be sold to somebody. And the more and more that burden falls on the Federal Reserve, the more and more weakness that an undermining of the dollar that does. Because you know, the Bank of Japan um, is in a similar situation. And, and if there's anything that everybody should be watching this year, it's the Bank of Japan. Because the Bank of Japan and the situation in Japan with quantitative easing has been held up as, if the Japanese can do this, everybody can do this. They've managed to print so much money, they've got 252% debt to GDP, and Japan is fine. So the US will be fine, and the UK will be fine, and Australia will be fine. You know, this is, this is not the case. The Japanese bond market, we won't go into it here, but it's a very, very different beast to the US Treasury market. It's mostly owned domestically. And the Bank of Japan have been forced in the last uh, six weeks or so to rethink the peg they had on the yield curve of the Japanese 10-year, and I don't want to get too technical, but they basically put something in place that stipulated that they weren't going to allow the yield on the Japanese 10-year bond to rise above 25 basis points, and it stayed there, and to the point where the Japanese 10-year bond didn't trade for days on end, which is unthinkable in a G7 bond market. Slowly, the pressure on the Bank of Japan ramped up, the yen got weaker as the dollar got stronger, and the market started to realize that the, Japanese, the Bank of Japan was going to struggle to maintain that peg. And they finally started chipping away and trying to sell more bonds to the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan was forced to raise the cap on the bond market because they couldn't afford to keep buying them anymore. And that's when we saw the yen go from 115 to 150 in no time at all, which is a, a crazy move. So if you watch the Bank of Japan, you watch the moves they make and you watch the effect it has on the currency, you'll see the options facing the US. It's, it's, it's a horse of a different color but all these central banks are in a situation where they have to try and save their bond markets or they have to try and save their currencies. They can't, they can't do both. And so for the United States, nothing is more important than the sovereign bond market, even the currency. Right. Uh, and we've seen that multiple times in history. You know, the, our dollar, your problem still exists, but our bond market, our problem is a, is a much bigger thing. So I think keep an eye on the Bank of Japan, uh, watch the pressure they're under, watch what happens when they succumb to that pressure. Um, and when that transmits and transmutes through to the US dollar, the effect will be much, much bigger simply because the dollar and US treasury are owned much more broadly than JGBs in the yen. Now, I have to ask you, Grant, what, if you were to speculate, what comes next, right? We've seen some transactions. Ghana just received some yep. oil in exchange for gold that they produced, setting an example of how this can function. There's a number of gold producing nations that could do the same thing. We've seen treasuries all over the world rebalance their reserves sell US dollars, either for a mix of Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, and yuan, or just for gold. Yeah. And the gold stockpiling has been uh, record-breaking, to say the least. I think you know record rates for the previous 55 years. If you were to forecast, you know, we, we spoke about Japan. What else, Grant, what else could happen that would finally turn people's heads and create headlines of change? Is there a catalyst? in front of you. Well, it's, it's, again, it's, it's a very slow-moving train wreck, this. Yeah, um, okay. but, but what we've seen for almost a decade now is an argument about whether this de-dollarization was happening, right? That argument's done. It's, right. it's absolutely happening. And there is, there's, there's no argument about that anymore. You can see it, uh, and you don't have to look as closely today as you did six months ago, even. Um, it's happening. So the question is, at what speed does it happen? And is there a tipping point out there where... A, 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 a cascade of real problems start to unfold. And I suspect there is a tipping point out. Whether we get there or not is another matter because as we approach it, it's going to be desperation time. Right. But the, the point is this is, a, this is a fundamental shift that we're seeing now. We've had 
a monetary system since 1973 that has been predicated around a single global reserve currency of the US dollar. Um, Mark Moss put a slide up earlier saying that the Russians have diversified their reserves to 17% yuan, and I think 80% gold now. Right. So there's a, there, that's the kind of canary in the coal mine, if you like. That's the way people are going to start to think. And if you think about the percentage of reserves of dollars that most countries hold because of this energy dynamic, you don't have to have a repudiation of the dollar. If the, the world decides to go from 80% dollar reserve to 70% dollar reserves, that's a huge shift in terms, because that 10% of the multiple trillions of dollars held elsewhere around the world needs to be replaced by the Fed. When that debt has to roll over, it needs to be replaced by the Fed. So we, we as investors need to realize that things have changed, not just with this dynamic, but also this, this four, five decade long deflationary or disinflationary tailwind that we've had has changed to an inflationary one. And all the focus now is on the pivot and when the Fed are going to start QE again and the fact that we can get back to business as usual, we can buy the dip again. Um, no. I'm here to tell you today that's not how you need to think anymore. You need to reassess how you manage your portfolios. You need to realize that inflation is going to be a risk. Um, they've changed the CPI basket to make sure that those numbers come down. But the problem is not necessarily the CPI numbers now, it's the price of eggs and it's the price of natural gas. And it's the fact that in the real world, for the first time in a couple of decades, people are being told that the CPI is falling, but when it goes up 9% a year and then only goes up 5% the next year, it's not going down. The cost of living is not going down. And there was an article out this morning talking about 67% of Americans surveyed are having to pause contributions to their retirement uh, pots to, uh, to, to defray the cost of living increase right now. So this is a real world problem. And so as we think about our portfolios and we think about how the Fed's gonna come in, they're gonna cut rates and stocks are gonna go up, it's not gonna be that simple anymore. It's gonna get much, much harder and inflation is gonna start to impact company results. We're starting to see that already at the beginnings of earnings season here. We're starting to see companies like Intel, which you would think, given all the chip wars going on, would be in a fantastic position. Terrible yeah. results. We're seeing Microsoft struggling. You are going to see this feed through into the real economy and real results, which will you know, re-rate a lot of equities. So rethink everything. And I need to ask you, therefore, you know, what's the angle for investors? You spoke a little bit about portfolio rebalancing, a little bit about this isn't a time to buy the dip. It's not going to be game on again in the equities market anytime soon. So you know, are there angles investors can play? Speaking to the audience, yeah. they're here for capital allocation ideas. What do you have to say? Yeah, I think I, think I made the point this morning, and it's the most important point, I think, to make. And it's a, a point that every conversation I've had in the last six months uh, with a whole bunch of smart investors, whether they're pension fund guys or high net worths or family offices or hedge funds, everybody is talking about how I can be paid 4.5% to wait. Sorry, I can buy US time? treasuries, I can buy two-year treasuries and get paid 4.5% right. to take no risk whatsoever and to watch and to wait and to see until I get some real signs of being able to go into various asset classes. Now, I think we're at the beginning of a commodities bull market but that doesn't mean you just put all your chips in to the commodity space right now. It's just not a smart thing to do because there will be moments in time when these stocks are on sale. There will be moments in time where the dollar has a big rally for whatever reason and the commodity stocks get tanked. But if you can sit in a risk-free asset earning 4.5% uh, while that happens and then selectively swap that capital for good companies with good resources that are on sale, it's a very different way of thinking that we've had the last 10 years where it's been, I need to be all in the markets because I'm getting nothing in the bank. So that, that mindset, this idea that I don't have to be in a hurry anymore. I can be patient, I can sit, I can get paid. Yes, I'm not keeping up with inflation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the 4.5% won't cover your costs, right? right. Um, so being patient now and, and trying to pick good companies instead of saying, right, I'm going to buy 
the mining ETF or the technology ETF. You know, we've all got very lazy because we could because everything went up. Yeah. Now it's a time to be selective. It's a time to be patient. And it's a time to recognize that you can afford to be patient now. And that's a, that's a big shift in mindset from this panic, get me in, put yeah. my chips in, yeah. you know, FOMO. The idea of FOMO, you need to wipe that out of your minds for now. Yeah. Just get rid of FOMO. Yeah, I uh, thank you very much for sharing that because you're right. I also believe we're in the early stages of a commodity cycle, but there's going to be innings to this, yeah, right? Absolutely. And as I said this morning, I know way too many people, well, I know a lot of people who added a zero to their net worth in the gold market of 2020. And I know way too many that gave it all back in 2022, yeah. right? And it's never a straight ride up. And so, you know, how do you talk to me about being patient? You mentioned treasuries, um, you know, obviously gold, it's your option on liquidity. Any other strategies that give investors the ability to sit back, wait, and be liquid when others aren't, other than gold and treasuries, is that it? Well, I, th I think this is, this is everybody in this room is doing that now. They're out here on a Sunday mm. looking at companies that might offer them great returns. And that's incredibly important to do, you know. Like I said, if you, if you want to buy the minor ETF, and, and I don't want to steal Brent's thunder, but Brent's going to talk about this tomorrow in his talk. We were talking about this over lunch. And he told me some phenomenal statistics that just blew my mind. Uh, and I, would, I, I said, I don't want to steal his thunder. That wouldn't be fair. But you realize that just going and buying mining ETFs is not the way to make money. So in terms of what investors can do is be diligent, do the work. You know, none of us really likes to work any more than we have to, but right now, coming to events like this and talking to the companies and really getting a sense of what they do and how they're positioned and what their plans are and understanding which companies you think are going to perform well and which management teams you trust, that's the way to make real money over time, is to buy the right companies, not just spray your money because it's easier to just spray it at resource stocks. 100%. Have you guys gotten some value from this? I hope so. It's only... 20 minutes, but. I'd encourage you all to check out Grant's newsletter. It's a can't miss every single month. Grant will be joining me again today on the main stage at five o'clock, I believe. Yeah, five o'clock, we're back. So. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank, Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. This is Jay Martin.